Welcome to another class on the greatness of the kingdom. The last study we had was the uh, establishment of the prophetic kingdom. We talked about eschatology in the end times. We talked about the biblical um, view of eschatology, which says that there will be an antichrist, there will be a beast, and there will be a false prophet in the last days, what we call the unholy trinity. Now, our studies, we start on page 206 in The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McClain. And <clears throat> we have a lot of resources that we go from this. Here is uh, The Theocratic Kingdom by George N. H. Peters. There's a three-volume set. The Seven Dispensations by uh, Dr. J. R. Gray. God's Ultimate Purpose. God's Expanded Panorama. God's Eternal Purpose. These are some of the books that we that we're studying in this, and then the Millennial Kingdom by John Wolverd. Now, all of these books are resources, and these books, uh, Alva J. McLean used in his research here. He quotes N. H. Peters, George N. H. Peters, many many times. Let's go back to the eschatology of last week the eschatology of Islam compared to the eschatology of the Bible. The Bible talks about this false prophet, it talks about the Antichrist, and it talks about the beast. The Antichrist will set up a reign for seven years, according to the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Joel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Daniel. And he will make a treaty with Israel, Israel will be back in their land. Of course, we look now at the period of time in which we live in the end of the church age and we find the regathering of Israel. Israel is back in the land. Those that did not believe that Israel had any purpose or part in God's economy in the last days are somewhat surprised that Israel is back in the land after 2,000 years being gone. Now the, the Sunnahs, the Hadiths, and the Quran talk about the, uh, the Amman Mahdi. They talk about the beast. They talk about Issa, Jesus. We talked a lot about the Mahdi last week. Uh, quoting their work, it says, the Holy Prophet Muhammad had prophesied about several events that will occur uh, just before the event of the Day of Judgment. And among these, the uh, Rasulah has foretold the advent of one of his descendants, Almighty, the guided one, which will materialize when the believers are severely oppressed in every corner of the world. He will fight the oppressors, unite the Muslims, bring peace and justice to the world and world all over the Arabs, and lead in prayer at Mecca, at which time Issa, or Jesus, returns. And they say this is not the Messiah of, of the Jews, of course. There are... Uh, Ten things that they look forward to in this last time. Let's review that for just a moment. Then we're going to talk about the the Mahdi is going to be the impersonage of Muhammad. He's going to have the spirit of Muhammad in him, and he's going to be one of the descendants of Muhammad. And let's just see what they say. From the family of the prophet has descended Hussein, son of Fatima. He appears at the end of time, number three, when the earth is filled with injustice and tyranny and believers are severely oppressed. He appears when a severe earthquake will occur and green grass will grow presumptively in Arabia. Fill the earth with justice and equity, and that's why he's going to go out conquering to conquer, and he's going to kill. He'll spread brotherhood and e equity and devotion among Muslims. Rule over the Muslim com community, according to the Hadith, for seven years. Live and act like the qualities of the Holy Prophet. These are the things that the uh, Mahdi is going to do. The Mahdi will be helped by a beast. And, of course, Issa is the one. Now, Issa, the Jesus of the Bible is going to come back, and he's going to save the Jews. 
He's going to rapture the Christians just prior to that. He's going to save the Jews. He's going to fight for them on this earth. And they're going to be protected for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then he's going to bring in the millennial kingdom for 1,000 years, according to the Bible and all the verses that we're talking about. Let me read you a description of this beast, this Dabat uh, al-Ard. In Muslim belief, will be one of the signs of the coming of the last day. This creature will appear after the sun rises in the west. The sun's going to rise in the west, not the east. A phrase appears in the Quran, in the Surah an Nami, Namil. The term is also appears in the Hadith, which expands upon the activities of the beast. The Quran mentions that the beast will address the unbelievers and admonish them for their lack of attention towards God. He will encourage them to, to uh, do jihad, which is war, holy war. The following is a purport of the Quranic verse that has been discussed. When the word is fulfilled against them, the unjust, we shall produce from the earth a beast face to face them. He will speak to them for that mankind did not believe with assurance of our signs. The Quran, Surah 27, Al-Namel. The beast is mentioned to have a, the staff of Moses, the seal of Solomon. It will strike the face of the disbelievers with the ring of Solomon, and he's going to turn them black, by the way. He is going to mark the uh, true Islamic believers with a mark on their arm and on their forehead, which many believe will be there is no God but Allah and Muhammad, and he has no uh, companion, and Muhammad is his prophet or Muhammad is his messenger. He was destined for hell, these people with the black faces, will be written on his forehead, and his face will be blackened, and it will brighten the face of the believer with the staff of Moses. He is destined for fire eyes and will be written on his forehead. As it is seen, when the beast emerges, people will start to believe, but belief uh, will not be accepted anymore because of the emergency of the major signs. In Al Karamek's book, Tad Hikara, the beast is described. Reported that Ibn al Zubiyar described the beast and said his head is like the head of a bull, its eyes like the eyes of a pig, its ears like the ears of an elephant, its horns like the horn of a stag, its neck like the neck of an ostrich, its chest like the chest of a lion, its color like the color of a tiger, its haunches are like the haunches of a cat, its tail is like the tail of a ram, and its legs are like the legs of a camel with between each pair of its joints is a distance of 20 feet. So this is a pretty big beast. Now this beast will force people. It will help fight the war, jihad. And it will force people to either believe in Allah and Muhammad or they will be marked for death and hell. So we have the Jesus of Muhammad is going to kill all the Jews kill all the Christians, break the cross, and uh, kill all the pigs. The uh, Mahdi of the Surahs, the Hadiths, and the Quran is going to arise when he's 40 years old. He's going to be uh, forced to, to take the, the call, caliphate. He will then go to Mecca. He will receive uh, many followers. He will begin holy war on the rest of the world. And that is the story of the two opposites, the two poles of eschatology between Islam and the Bible. Now let's talk about the government. Now this government's going to come. That's the one in the last days. On page 206, chapter number 17, the government in the kingdom of Old Testament prophecy. Thus there is during the kingdom period a well-ordained system of government embracing the whole earth administered by Christ through those whom he appoints, a system adopted to meet the needs of all its inhabitants and all their varied conditions and degrees of intellectual development. Samuel J. Adams, Andrews. 
It is generally conceded that uh, however lofty and good our basic principles may be in the field of political science, they cannot be effective in human life except by implementation through concrete forms and organizations. Even the so-called leavening process, according to those who insist upon exclusive spiritual kingdom of God, could not operate in a vacuum. You've got to have meal to put the leaven in. It had to have three measures of meal as a physical structure in which to accomplish its work. Thus, uh, as is becoming clearer in modern times, the reformers of government must become interested in organization forms which are the body through which principles and ideals are realized in human life. And if the body apart from the spirit is dead, it is likewise true that the human spirit apart from the body can produce no effective results in the world of sense experience. Hence, as far as the present life and world are concerned, there can be no longer any valid argument about the importance and perceptible forms for the realization of political ideals. The only, question are, the only questions are, are the people of God in their present state on earth wholly competent to produce these essential forms of organ and organizations? And second, may they legitimately look for some supernatural reinforcement from above for the purpose of establishing such forms on earth among men. In their visions of the future mediatorial kingdom of God, the Old Testament prophets devote considerable space to these matters. And we're talking about this period of time right here when there's 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth. Israel will be the administrators of that kingdom. The Lord and his bride will be resting in New Jerusalem above the earth for that 1,000 years. At the end of that period of time, there will be... Uh, and the devil is in the bottomless pit during all this period of time. All the demons, there is no influence of Satan or his demonic or angelic forces on this earth at all. The earth is completely free of all demonic and devilish activity. Yet, it won't be perfect, even with a perfect ruler. We must be changed. The form of the mediatorial government, Isaiah 32 and 1. Behold, a king shall reign. Concerning this, there can be no question. The mediatorial kingdom of the Old Testament prophecy is a monarchial in form. Its ruler is a king who will sit upon a throne, and the government will be upon his shoulder, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. He receives regal authority and exercises it by divine grant. He is God, king, God's king established upon his throne on earth, by the supernatural power of the God of heaven, Psalm 2 and 6, Daniel 2, 44 and 7, 14. All the functions of government are centered in the glorious person of this mediatorial king. The prophet Isaiah paints a vivid picture of the political situation in the days of the, of the established kingdom. Then the eyes of men shall see the king and his beauty, ruling upon the earth as a judge, lawgiver and king, Isaiah 33, 17 and 22. A remarkable forecast of the conventional divisions of modern government, judicial, legislative, and executive. The chief problem in the operation of government is, has always been to keep these necessary functions in a state of proper balance and at the same time to provide some center of unification. This problem has never been wholly solved. Human government, therefore, always swings between two opposite poles of regimentation. Fragmentation, the former leading to the sacrifice of liberty in the interest of strength, the later in a sacrifice of strength in the interest of liberty. And the head of the state tends to become either a dictator or a mere symbol. The founding fathers of our American state, approaching their task with deep suspicion of human nature, designed an ingenious system of checks and balances to separate these three functions into departments and keep any one of them from usurping too much power, a balance of power. Although it seems clumsy and inefficient at times, lacking both in unity and economy, nevertheless our government has furnished a welcome refuge for political liberty in a sinful world and will continue to do so if we can keep it. 
But this precarious balance of powers is not the most ideal political form. When God's own glorious king takes over the kingdoms of the earth, it will be safe at last to concentrate all the functions of the state in one person because he is true, he is honest, he is pure at heart. This does not mean that he will do everything, but rather that he will be the directing head and final authority, thus providing a unifying center, but unifi infinitely wise and good for all the activities of government, something which no state on earth has ever enjoyed. Under his bene beneficent rule, it will no longer be necessary to sacrifice political unity and strength in the interest of political liberty. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed, John 8 and 36. This principle is true in every department of human life, whether spiritual or political. The nature of the mediatorial governments, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne, Psalm 89 and verse 14. It will be a rule based on moral principles. In the prophets, four great words are used to indicate these principles, truth, holiness, righteousness, and justice. Under the reign of the coming king, the, under the <coughs> coming king, the earth will rejoice and the islands will be glad because of righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, Psalm 97, 1 and 2. His kingdom will prosper because he will execute justice and righteousness in the land, Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. As the visible center of his government, Jerusalem will be called or shall be called the city of truth, the holy mountain. Mountain in the Bible most generally means government, Zechariah 8 and 3. The Hebrew terms used in Isaiah 16 and 5 suggest the moral character of the king's reign. He will not only keep to the forms of the law, judging, but he will also interest himself to find the substantial right in every case seeking judgment. And then he will promptly execute the verdict, hasting righteousness. As to the desperate need of the world for the establishment of such a government, there is clear evidence in every hand. Even in the most enlightened and modern times, states, too often the tragic confession of ancient Israel could be written over its gates. Justice is turned away backward, and righteousness stands afar. For truth has fallen in the street, and up, uprightness cannot enter, Isaiah 59 and verse 14. These great moral principles of the mediatorial government will be enforced by sanctions of supernatural power. The answer of God to all people and kings who venture to set themselves against the beneficent rule of the coming kingdom is solely commissioned to his anointed king. Thou art my son, ask of me, and I shall give to you the heathen nations for your inheritance. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2, 7 and 9. No longer will the wicked oppressor of the poor be able to utter his, his cynical judgments. God hath forgotten, he hides his faith, he shall never see it. Psalm 10, 9 and 11. No longer will the righteous be troubled about the ways of God in the world where things seem to be upside down. Psalm 73, 2 through 16. The question as to whether or not we live in a moral universe will no longer be a subject for philosophical debate. For in the coming kingdom, the judgments of God will be immediate and tangible. Tangible means, by the way, that which may be touched. Zechariah 14, 7 through 19, Isaiah 66, 24. The long period of God's judicial silence, which men have perversely construed as evidence of moral indifference instead of long-suffering mercy on the part of God, will come to an end in Psalm 50 and 21. With the judgments of a holy God once more manifest in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness, Isaiah 26 and verse 9. But moral government is more than an infallible determination of what is right and is flexible, inflexible enforcement. There must be place for mercy and tenderness. By the way, the Lord of God of heaven, Jehovah, God the Son, he is called the man of loving kindness. 
for mercy and tenderness in dealing with the ignorant and the erring. Therefore we read Isaiah 16 and 5, that in the mercy shall be the throne of established. The king who comes to rule with a strong hand will at the same time feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, carry them to his bosom, and shall gently lead those who are with young. Isaiah 49 through 11. And if there be swift and terrible justice for all who rebel, it is also true that blessed are all they who put their trust in him. Psalm 2, 9 and 12. To maintain a perfect balance between mercy and justice, it is never an, a, an easy achievement. Historically, governments have been prone to swing between the two opposite poles of legal harshness on the one hand and sentimental laxness on the other. And the end is a disaster in either case. But under the coming mediatorial kingdom, the perfect equilibrium shall be reached. Its happy subjects will be able to say mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85 and verse 10. On page 209, the external organization of mediatorial kingdom. Behold, a king shall reign and princes shall rule. Isaiah 32 and verse 1. Here it must be said that in any government involving the participation of finite persons, there must be some structural form. As S.J. Andrews has said, there is during the kingdom period a well-ordered system of government that is true even to the universal kingdom with its divine throne in heaven among the angelic ministers of God that there is an organization. Michael is named as one of the chief princes who in his relation to the, to the earthly matters is the great prince with special responsibilities to the nation of Israel, Daniel 10 and 13 and 12 and 1. There are armies in heaven, Revelation 19 and verse 14, from which our Lord have, could have called 12 legions of angels, Matthew 26, 15, or 53. And however deep the mystery may, have been, may be, even some measure of protocol seems to be carefully observed in the heavenly organization of principalities and powers, Jude 9. Those who accept the inspired description of the heavenly kingdom and can hardly with any degree of consistency reject the idea of organization in God's kingdom and on earth as set forth in the Old Testament prophets. Rather, strain, ra rather strangely, some of the most determined opponents of the idea of an organized millennial kingdom on earth are at the same time the most insatiable organized organizers of the Christian church, which they consider to be God's present spiritual kingdom on earth. First, at the head of the mediatorial kingdom, of course, there is a king. There must be a king for a kingdom, Isaiah 32 and verse 1. In the covenant with Abraham, it is promised that kings shall come out of you, Genesis 17 and verse 6. But among these kings, there is one who is above all. He is the Lord who shall reign be king over all the earth, the Lord, and his name, one. Zechariah 14, verse 9. The gracious New Testament promise, we shall reign with him, 2 Timothy 2, 12, shall never blind our eyes in the unbridgeable gulf between him and us. He is infinite. We are finite. He is perfect in holiness. We are sinners and saved by grace. In him alone resides the regal uh, authority, which is final and complete, which cannot be equally shared by even the highest and best of his creatures. Second, in the structure of the mediatorial government, the prophets put the saints following his vision of this sequence of the world empires, which is consummated at the coming of the king like unto son of man, to establish an everlasting kingdom on earth. Daniel observes that the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel 7, 13 and 18. This important fact is asserted three times within the space of a single chapter. 18, 22 and 27. As the identification of these saints, it will be sufficient to say that they are saved of God, doubtless glorified, for there is a resurrection set at the time of the consummation, Daniel 12, 1 through 3. 
Perhaps these are the princes of Isaiah, third soon one, who will, who will rule in judgment. In Ezekiel's visions of the coming kingdom, David is named prince who will resume his shepherdly care and reign in the midst of Israel forever. 37, 24 through 25, and 34, 23, and 24. If the saints are to possess the kingdom, there can be no sound of hermeneutical reason for de denying David a regal position in that kingdom. The anti-millennial use of these references as to David as an argument against literal interpretation rather, seems rather absurd. Even if the passage referred to Messiah, might not the name be a patriotic, properly applied to the greater son of David. But there can be no inserpable, superable objection to a reference here to the historical king of Israel. Certainly David will be among the saints who will possess the kingdom. The same can be said of Zerubbabel, Haggai 2.23. These Old Testament leaders may indeed be typical of the future Messianic king, but there is no sound reason for denying to them a place of honor in the Messiah's kingdom, Matthew 8 and verse 11. Third, at the next level in the governmental instruction, the prophets all agree in presenting the living nation of Israel in the future kingdom. This historic people will be at last realized fully the international supremacy implied by the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is a unconditional covenant. The Davidic covenant is an unconditional covenant. It does not depend upon man. It depends mainly and solely upon the promises of God. They are the chosen seed of Abraham, the friend of God, and therefore all attempts to destroy them must fail. For God will uphold them with his own right hand and fulfill his promises to them, Isaiah 41, 8 through 16. This restoration of the supremacy of this nation will be accomplished by the Messianic king who is God's servant to do this very thing, Isaiah 49, verse 6. There could be no question here about the identity, for the prophet clearly distinguishes Israel from the Gentiles and from the church. If these people in their long history of persecution and affliction should feel that they are cast off and forgotten, the answer of God is, Behold, I have given graven ye upon the palms of my hand, and thy walls are continually before me. Isaiah 49, verse 16. A mother may forget the child of her breast, God says, yet will I not forget you. Nothing in the whole field of Old Testament prophecy could be possibly surpass the brilliance and grandeur of the 60th chapter of Isaiah. And its central theme is the restoration and world supremacy of the nation of Israel. According to all the principles of sensible interpretation, the people under consideration in Isaiah 60 are the same in chapter 59. It can only be a theological prejudice that sees in chapter 59 the sins of the Jews and in chapter 60 the glory of the church. The prophet begins with a dramatic address to the people. Arise and shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Isaiah 16, verse 1. Then he sees them as they return from their worldwide dispersion back to their own land and city. The nations which have afflicted them now become come to pay homage to them as the chosen people of God. Foreign kings shall minister to them. The wealth of the nation shall be devoted to their prosperity and the beautification of the sanctuary of their God. 11, 13, 16, and 17. The days of their mourning will be ended. Verse 20. Violence and destruction will be no more invade their borders. Their political supremacy will be guaranteed by the edict of Jehovah. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Yes, those nations shall be utterly wasted. But the world supremacy of Israel, as set forth in the prophets, is never an end in itself. Its grand purpose is the welfare of all nations, as asserted in the original covenant, in ye shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12 and verse 3. All the hard discipline of centuries has had on the one divinely, on one divine intention, the preparation of a nation to be channel of divine blessing 
to the world and unable to solve its own problems. To see this clearly sweeps away all the objections to the idea of a chosen nation. For along with the divine election of Israel to a place of world supremacy, there also attached a solemn responsibility. The nation of Israel has been chosen above all the nations to be a servant of God to bring good to each and every nation. Isaiah 41, 8 and 9. All anti-Semitic prejudice as well as narrow Semitic pride arises out of blindness to the benevolent purpose of God. Once the eyes of men are opened to this divine purpose, the world must rejoice in favor of God to Israel. 49.13 The 47th Psalm represents a rather strange prophetic picture of all people clapping their hands for joy in the day when Jehovah will bring these very peoples and nations under the feet of Jehovah or Israel. Verse 1-3 Yet such an attitude is not so strange in the light of the unimaginable blessing that to be brought to the world through the supremacy of Israel. Furthermore, the prayer of Isaiah in Psalm 67 may seem rather selfish at first sight. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. But the next verse lifts the prayer infinitely above all selfish considerations. For the purpose of God's blessing upon Israel is plainly stated, that your way may be known upon the earth, your saving health among all the nations. In the light of this good purpose of God, the nations will be glad and sing for joy. For the nation of Israel, repentant and reconciled to God, shall be a crown of glory in the land in the hand of the Lord and royal diadem in the hand of your God. Isaiah 62 and 3. Fourth, at the lowest level, but definitely within the political framework of the mediatorial government, we shall find the Gentile nations. As we have already seen, the prophetic picture includes Gentile nations and rulers. The peculiar, the peculiar cultural values of the various nations, insofar as they may be used to contribute to the good of all, will not be abolished. In this respect, there will be no reduction of human society to one dull, faceless mediocrity as it appears in the one world of Marxism. Many nations will be found within the structure of the coming kingdom. Their values and substance are consecrated to the Lord of the whole earth. Micah 4 and 12 and 11 through 13. In the day the princes of the peoples are gathered together to be the people of the God, of the God of Abraham, Psalm 49, 47 and verse 9. And these nations will be owned of Jehovah as nations they are called by my name, Amos 9 and 12. Even those peoples which were once enemies of Israel and her God may find a place of favor within the future mediatorial kingdom, Isaiah 19, 23-25. For as the New Testament reminds us, God is the God of all men, whether Jew or Gentile, Romans 3 and 29. The placing of the great Gentile nations at a lower political level in the coming kingdoms may seem to some a humiliating arrangement. But this feeling is only manifestation of that ancient national pride which arises out of superior size and strength rather than superior contributions to the general welfare of the world. In that coming kingdom, it will be the true of nations as well as men that whosoever will be chief among you, let him be servant, Matthew 20, 27. For that matter, it is recognized even today, at least in theory, that the ablest should occupy the highest echelons of human government, and also that it is no necessary disgrace for others to concur to such a disposition of talent. Page number 213, number 4. The extent and duration of the mediatorial kingdom, all nations shall serve him, his name shall endure forever, Psalm 72, 11 and 17. First, it will be universal in extent. In that day, the prophet Zechariah writes, The Lord shall be king over all the earth, 14 and verse 9. The kingdoms will include all nations, Isaiah 2 and 2. In his vision of the future kingdom, Daniel sees a stone which smites the current political systems and then becomes a great mountain which fills the whole earth, 2, 34 and 35. In a later vision, the kingdom is revealed as one which will include all people, nations, and languages, 714. And the psalmist describes in still greater detail the universal scope of the reign of God's mediatorial kingdom. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea. 
and from the river unto the ends of the earth, and they that dwell on the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. Yes, all the kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. 72, 8 through 11. Instead of regarding government as a necessary evil, the less of it, the better. The beneficent rule of the kingdom will extend to every department of human life and affect in some way its detail. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. This used to be on the mitre of the high priest. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 14, 20, and 21. It would be hard to imagine anything in human life more trivial than the tinkling of bells which men have decorated with ho their horses. Remember the, the bells on the sleigh, the sleigh bells as they ring? Yet even on such things the prophet sees the sacred words which appeared on the golden plate on the diadem of the high priest without which he could not minister on pain of death. Exodus 20, 36-43. Thus the age-long description between sacred and secular still Secular things still so dear to the hearts of many who insist that Zechariah's prophecy must be fulfilled in the present Christian church will at last disappear in the immediate presence of the great king who is the lawgiver, who is the giver and sustainer of all that exists. Everything both small and great will become holy to the touch of his rule. In his comment on the final two verses of Zechariah's book of prophecy, Talbot D. Chambers describes conditions under the future commonwealth in the words which deserve to be quoted in this connection. I apologize for my reading because I can barely see, and I'm doing this before I lose my sight. And this is more difficult right here, so please bear with me. The ordinary conditions of human life are not to be reversed. But on the contrary, the infusion of grace will be so large and general that every rank of class will feel it, and its efforts, effects will be seen in all the relations of life, purifying and elevating without upturning or destroying, in business and recreation and politics and art and literature and social life, in the domestic circle, there will be a distinct and cordial recognition of all the claims of God and the supremacy of His law. There will be no more divorce anywhere between religion and morality. No demand that any department of human activity shall be deemed beyond the domain of conscience. Yet even the bells on the horses bearing the same sacred inscription, which once flashed on the diadem of the high priest, nothing can be found too small or too familiar to be consecrated to the Lord. Hallelujah. The religious spirit will prevail everywhere, securing justice, truth, kindness, and courtesy among men, doing away with wars and contentions and jealousies and competitions and hallowing trades and handicrafts and softening and inevitable contrast of ranks and gifts and conditions and binding men to one another in their devotion to a common master in heaven, thus introducing the true city of God on earth, for which all saints long with an everlasting desire an ever-increasing desire. The idea of such a commonwealth originated in the scriptures, and it can be realized only in the way they point out. All schemes of political, social, and even moral reform, apart from the principles of the word, are the merest chimeras. There are impossible accomplishments, and if accomplished, would disappoint their projectors. Although the writer of these words has accurately and beautifully described the world conditions which are yet to be realized in the future, he makes the mistake of supposing that all this will be accomplished by men in exercise of true religion. Written nearly a century ago, one wonders whether Dr. Chambers would express such optimism in the face of the present world situation. Second, the kingdom will be everlasting in duration, unlike the greatest of earthly rulers, whose days are best only a handbreadth of time. They are to die like men. Kings, God's king shall live, and his name shall endure forever. Psalm 72, 15 and 17. Because he ever lives with the power of the endless time, life, 
His kingdom will live in everlasting dominion, Daniel 7 and 14. Its authority and power will never suffer any diminution or reset reverses. Such are the common to governments of men. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom in order that to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth forevermore. And this continuity is assured because its foundation is not in man but in God. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9 and 6. Jehovah Sabaoth. The regal civilizations established by men and nations in the past, according to Spangler's gloomy philosophy of history, have all their mornings and their high noons and then the twilight of oblivion. But God will put an end to this dreary cycle of history when he sets up a kingdom and a culture which, it can be said, the sun shall no more go down, Isaiah 16, verse 20. In a remarkable description of its enduring quality, the prophet Daniel seems to pile up verbal absolutes. It is a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and shall not be left to another people and which shall stand forever, 244. All of this is guaranteed by the covenant of oath of the holy God who will not lie, Psalm 89, 34, and 37. This seeming chronological discrepancy between the everlasting character of the, of the Old Testament prophetic kingdom and the thousand-year reign described in Revelation 20 be, will be discussed in a later chapter. The method of prophecy must be kept in mind, the bringing of things together in the vision which history will separate in their fulfillment. There are intimations of the Old Testament prophets, however, which suggest a time limitation in a Messiah's kingdom on earth prior to the final judgment. The prophet Isaiah speaks of certain rebels among the high ones that are on high, angelic beings and the kings of the earth, 2421. The next verse, 22, says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prisons after many days, and shall they be visited, punished. The many days here corresponds to 1,000 years of Revelation 20. Both begin with the imprisonment of satanic human rebels and end with the final judgment of the prisoners. Revelation 19, 20 through 20 and verse 3. With 20, 11 through 15, during the many days, the Lord of hosts shall reign in Jerusalem gloriously, Isaiah 24, 23. In reconciliation of the many days with the idea of everlasting will be found in the fact that in the close of human history, the mediatorial kingdom of our Lord will be merged into the universal kingdom and thus perpetuate forever, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Thank you for your attention. I hope these words have blessed you as we look at the mediatorial kingdom that it will be established by our Savior and our Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great book written so many years ago that blesses our hearts still to this day. Help us to understand that there will be a glorious kingdom to come, that we can be part of it. Please give us the will. Please give us the desire to serve you and to glorify you with our lives. Forgive us in Jesus' name we pray and guide us our every footsteps. Amen.